Bo Goldman was the Oscar-winning screenwriter of such films as Shoot the Moon, Melvin and Howard, Scent of a Woman, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I desperately wanted to welcome him on the show, as, as One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was one of the defining movies in my life, and he so graciously agreed in 2008. Earlier this week, his son-in-law, director Todd Field, announced that Mr. Goldman had passed away at the age of 90. In tribute to Mr. Goldman and his extraordinary accomplishments in film, here is a replay of our interview. Uh, I wanted to get to, uh, before you started started screenwriting, uh, you started out in the theater and, and you did some television production. Is that how you got started in the business? Well, yes, I, I began um, actually uh, in college, writing college shows at Princeton, the, the Triangle Show, which uh, I re- really went to Princeton for because some greats, which probably precede your time, uh, had been there, uh, Scott Fitzgerald and, and Joshua Logan, who was a great Broadway director, and, and Jimmy Stewart, the actor, they'd all been triangle people, and I was a terrible student, I spent my whole life there in McCarter Theater at Princeton, and I was asked to leave a number of times, but somehow I muddled through, and then uh, when I, I got out of, um, I, I wrote letters to everybody, um, to, just to try to see if I could work you know, with somebody, and I remember um, I wrote Oscar Hammerstein asking if I could somehow, um, you know, be a kind of archivist for him or file his work or something like that. Sure. And he said the place had already been taken by a neighbor, uh, uh, the son of a neighbor. His name was Stephen Sondheim. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, that was what I thought I was blighted for life. And and I, I um, then... Um, uh, worked for Julie Stein. I don't know if you know his name. He was a wonderful Broadway composer. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, a lot of great Sinatra songs and did the show Gypsy with Sondheim. And then um, I uh, worked on a show he was reopening that was a big flop called Hazel Flag, which had a couple of wonderful tunes in it. And, uh, and then he fired me only because he couldn't lay me off on the nut of the Broadway show. And so then I went to work in the mailroom at CBS, and I kind of got promoted and uh, through the years. And then I had to go into the Army for a couple of years. When I came back, I ended up working for a, a man who really was my mentor in life, uh, Fred Coe, who's a kind of forgotten creature who kind of created uh, live drama. Um, at Philco Television Playhouse, and then he'd come over to CBS to do Playhouse 90s, which are kind of, you know, old yes. things, which do, you know, they have box sets of them now. And there were wonderful shows, The Days of Wine and Roses, which became a movie, and right. and um, The Plot to Kill Stalin, old, old right, Man, right. which was a thing that Horton Foote wrote. And, and so I was his assistant. He kind of taught me everything that I needed to know. And at the same time, while I was working with him, I, I worked at night with my partner to get a Broadway show on, and we got lucky enough to get it on. It was based on Pride and Prejudice. It ran about three months with uh, Polly Bergen, who was an old television mm-hmm. performer, and uh, uh, Farley Granger, the actor. He played right. Darcy. And Mrs. Bennett was played by Hermione Gingold. I don't know if you remember her from Gigi, who sang... Uh, uh, yes, I remember it well with Maurice Chevalier. And yes, yes. We ran about um, three months. I remember the critic for the New York Times, the great Brooks Atkinson, said, um, Father Granger played Darcy with all the flexibility of a telephone pole. <laughs> and I, I thought, oh, Lord, this is my life. And, and I remember, you know, I was just destroyed. And, and I never got the second one on. And I just uh, uh, eventually bottomed out, kind of. And I had uh, six children. My right. wife, my first wife, and she's still my wife. And uh, and then uh, I was uh, finally got a job at PBS, and I did something called uh, they usually assign this to the new kid on the block, an American Christmas words and music. Hmm. So I wrote a lot of the songs with my partner, a lot of Christmas songs and stuff like that. And uh, Bert Lancaster because I always was kind of shooting for the moon. And I wrote him, and I said, would you come and be the host? And he said, yes, he would. Wow. wow. And so he was the host, and he kind of encouraged me, and a guy named Eddie Sharon, Edwin Sharon, who was a theater director, who did one movie uh, with Lancaster called Valdez is Coming, encouraged me to write movies. He said, you can do it. And the first movie I really wrote was Shoot the Moon, 
which kind of kicked around for years, and and uh, it was uh, a phrase which I learned in Hollywood. Uh, Everyone would say, "Oh, you know, it's a great calling card, Bo." You know, I said, right. "I said it's not a calling card; it's a movie." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so then, after you know, I got lucky enough with shoot with with Cuckoo's Nest and. And and uh, Melvin and Howard, it, um, it, it was done, and uh, I'm very proud of it. And one of the reasons here, I'm a, a disgusting shill, something I've never done in my life at the moment for for Shoot the Moon, which is really sort of the the child. It's like the orphan that you have, that nobody knows, and that whom you oh. love the, that you love the best. And it's and, a breath. It's a breathtaking screenplay. Uh, it, it's interesting how. Th- that was the first film before Cuckoo's Nest, before any of these other opportunities. Oh yeah, the first thing, and and that's what got me jobs, it got me the job on the Rose, and 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 other things. But but the thing is, I just want to let you know that finally they, because things got all screwed up with uh, it was a UA United Artists movie, and mm-hmm. these things get lost in the shuffle. But they've just made a DVD of it. Yes. And it was just released in November, and I hope everybody will go buy a copy. And, and now you can slap my wrist. <laughs> no, no, that's a great film. That's one of my favorite Albert Finney performances. So that, that's a, that's one of the first movies we rented on VHS. Oh, good. It's a great film. It's Very accurate, remarkable. I may add. Remarkable movie. And you you you've mentioned how happily married you've been all these years. Where did yeah. that come from? Because it really it really is a very insightful portrait of a, a disintegrating marriage yes it is yeah well i wasn't a happy mar- happily married every year you know but uh, <laughs> but but the thing is it was a kind of time it was in the early 70s and all my friends around me were getting divorced my brother was getting divorced and i saw all these things collapsing around me and i felt my marriage was in danger because i was such a failure and and i you know um the were you know sort of in melvin and howard i mean one guy at, at, at CAA and a top agent there keeps saying you keep writing the same movie over and over again, Bo, even though I like them all. And it, they're always about outsiders, really. I mean, there's something weirdly a kind of kinship between McMurphy and Melvin and Slade sure. and, and, mm-hmm. and, and the Rose. They're all losers to some degree, you know, who somehow have the right idea about what life is. And I felt... I did, yeah. and yet I was labeled a loser. You know, I mean, people would. Uh, and then, of course, that guy two years later was on the phone and begging me to write a script. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. But uh, so I, how I stayed married all the time is like there were bumps, of course, but this thing was happening all around, and and it was happening particularly to guys who were successful. I mean, I'd gone to all these privileged schools that my father felt was very important for me, and they were getting to be uh, partners at Sullivan and Cromwell and, and he, uh, head of uh, obstetrics at Physicians and Surgeon and, and or something like that. And, and there I was, you know, I had nothing. We'd moved 23 times. You know, I didn't own anything. The house I, I finally, when I got lucky, and moved into in 19... Uh, 79 in the Napa Valley, which I've just sold. Um, and I'm speaking to you from Maine now, where I'm going to live the rest of my life uh, in a barn and, uh, um, next to my daughter, my youngest daughter, and her husband, a wonderful young director, Todd Field. I don't know if you know his work. Yes, we do. Oh, amazing talent. Yeah. Oh, so he made one of my it. favorite movies last year. So. Yeah. Yeah. Little Children. Yes, yeah, one yeah. of my favorites. Yeah, and In the Bedroom. They're two beautiful movies. And so I'll be living there. But I, I, t- I did the first thing I ever owned in my life, other than a second-hand car, <laughs> was this, this place I bought, just this kind of wild piece of land up in Napa. And uh, finally it just became too much for my – I'm a city guy. It was too much for my wife to handle. And, and also Napa just changed completely like everything always does. Sure. And, Sure, but you talk you talk about the the early the early failures. Um, <clears throat> did that make you more reticent that that that, that you were going to succeed at this? Uh, and did it? I, I suppose it informed your writing. Uh, I never I was, had any idea about um, whether you know. I was lucky enough to get this show on. I was twenty six on Broadway. That was like a big thing to people, even though it, you know it wasn't successful. But it wasn't a dismal flop either. It ran a few months, but. But then I, I was ten years trying to get the next one on, and 
and and uh, it was impossible. It was like an old line about Broadway: you you can't make a living; you can only make a killing. And yeah. and and I could make a living, and I was you know um, jerking around, and and I just I kept trying, and and my wife stood behind me, and my children did, and. Yeah. You know, just, you know, because it's been a long time since I've really talked to anybody about my life, uh, you know, because I don't, usually it's always in conjunction with a movie coming out, and I don't have too many movies these days, and not, because I'm not, I'm not really trying, I just kind of, I don't want to be a professor emeritus, and I kind of keep my hand, and all my children practically work, work in the business, one's a top film editor, Another was an officer at Warner Brothers, and you know I begged them all, don't ever go into show business. Of course, they all did. But yeah, I just kept trying, you know. And I remember one of the things that Hammerstein said in this letter to me, and like, and sometimes I get dragged as a favor because the children of friends. So I, I've gone to two film, what do you call those things? You know, uh, film festivals, whatever, you know. Right. And because I can't stand it, I feel like an Indian, or I'm sorry, a Native American having his picture taken. And and <laughs> and, and so uh, I, I I I quoted this note that he'd handwritten, that he typed himself. And um, and I don't have a computer. I, I I still I just have an old. Uh, I'm still a schmuck with an Underwood, as Jack Warner would say. I've oh, never wow. learned how to use a computer and. And so he said, if if anything can stop you, Mr. Goldman, it will. And if nothing can stop you, it won't. Yeah. And that's kind of the only advice that's sort of dumb and, and, and I guess sort of uh, cliche-like. But, but it's true. You just, you, you, you have to keep trying. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I felt I was good, you know. I, I, I felt I was good. I mean, just. Uh, be, for shoot the moon, I had to get together. They wanted to do some publicity, so I had a little folder here just for this phone call. And I see a lot of the quotes in it. There are always things like life is more important than movies. I was, all I cared about was my life, that I could hold my life together. That sure. There's more drama in my family than any movie I could buy a ticket to. <laughs> and and, and I, I've always felt that. I mean, that doesn't go for everybody. I feel very much out of touch with the society now. I mean, I don't. I mean, I have a passion. I had a passionate love for America. My father uh, was a rich and powerful man who lost all his money before I was born in 1929, and we lived this kind of um, sad middle class life in which he was always living in the past and scrapbooks and so on. When he was, as he used to put it, on top of the world, you know. And it was and it was lonely. It was a very lonely life because he was always living in the past. But I always um, felt, you know, that I think everybody in Hollywood will give you a a story about restoration. You know, like my mother made the best brassiers in Brooklyn. You know, or my father did this or that. You know, but I don't feel that so much about myself. I just felt if I could make a success of my family life, which my father didn't. That would mean everything. The only thing is, is to have the option to do that. You know, yeah. to have that choice, you have yeah. to make money. And I well, stumbled into it. <laughs> well, you stumbled in a big way with Cuckoo's Nest. So, uh, t tell me how that opportunity came about. Oh, it's absolutely. Uh, um, my agent at the moment. He had taken me on just as a favor to somebody was Robbie Lance, who recently died, who was Milo Schwarman's agent. He was mm -hmm. a kind of uh, old school agent, kind of Viennese, you know. He was, uh, he was, he, they used to say Robbie with schlag because that's <laughs> the way he was. And he and he was up till ninety. I talked to him a couple of years ago. I worked with Milo, sort of under the table on something, and 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 um, yeah, Robbie was still his agent and. Uh, they were concerned about Jack Nicholson because after Chinatown he was very hot and he was not satisfied with the script of Cuckoo's Nest and they felt he was going to walk. And they also and uh, Milos was not satisfied with the script and Saul Sands, who's really he was like a kind of independent financier and of course you know he's done very well Saul. Sure. And uh, they, so I was cheap. Uh, I was paid eight thousand dollars to to rewrite Cuckoo's Nest, and it did two hundred million dollars. And they gave me a little bonus, and I have no regrets because everybody said, "Who would you rather be, you 
or the guy who, who I shared the credit with, whom I only met at the awards and I never saw again. And um, uh, and uh, sadly, I heard years later that he died. He'd never written another movie. And it, uh, I, I, he did very good work in sort of on the construction of the movie. But Milos came, and I was living in a little... Um, shack out at the beach you know and and uh i had been fi- i had off of the script of of uh shoot the moon uh which had been my calling card milo had seen that script and okay. he was interested in hire hiring me and uh uh so robbie said you could get him he probably will do a good job for you so he came out i was living in this little shack out at the beach my wife was running a fish and fresh bread store in eastern Long Island, which was supporting us. My kids used to put, you know, fillet fish and put it into these things in a little town called Sagaponic, which has somehow become somewhat fashionable. But we lived there all year round, and she ran this fish store. It was called Loaves and Fishes, and it's and. Um, she said, well, listen, if it doesn't work out, because I was with this movie, which was uh, Starting Over, which is eventually made with Burt Reynolds. And, sure, yeah. And I think Candace Bergen. And, right. Yeah, I was fired off of that. It's the only time I've ever been fired. And so I thought I was headed back, you know, to uh, stand around in the fish store. And Milos came out, and um, they sent me the script. And the night before I read it, I remember falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's, he's going to get very angry at me, but I don't care. And uh, I remember for you, not that it was bad, I just I had read the book when I was young. I remember I had, had uh, what do you call that thing, like that, it's called like the collegiate uh, mononucleosis, you know, when I was in college. I remember it being, I had a kind of eidetic memory about the book, and I thought, gee, I don't know about this thing, <laughs> and so on. And me and I came out, and I remember um, in the morning, and it, all we had was a couple of, uh, we had a month ago on the lease, we had a couple of those, uh, uh, what do you call those, little funny plump uh, cushions that you sit on. I forget what they're like, kiwi cushions or something. Yeah, yeah. And so he came, so he said, so what do you think? And so, and so I said, I don't know. And he said, well, what would you do, like in the first scene? And I remember I, I was thinking, I said, well, I think when he gets out of the car, I think McMurphy should kiss the guard goodbye. <laughs> and Milo said, it's good. And I remember that. And I didn't think anything of it. And it went on from there. We were there together for a long time, and I was hired. And we worked every day in uh, what was called Ellis Island West in those days, the Sunset Marquee Hotel. Yeah. And um, I guess you know it. You know, it's become somewhat fashionable now. I think a lot of musicians stay there. And uh, in those days, it was uh, you know it was like your entry into it was like uh, Ellis Island, you know, and to get into the movie business, you would stay there before you had a place. And we worked there every day. He used to, he had a 1965 World's Fair T-shirt and some old Czech swimming trunks, I remember. And I had to sit with my back to the big window that faced the pool, and, and he would look out, and every time some, a, a girl would go by, he would stop talking, I remember. <laughs> then he would offer me, because he would get hungry, he'd offer me, he drank, uh, you know, that Czech beer, Pilsener or Cal. He had cases of it there, and he would have one in the middle of the morning with some brown bread and cabbage. He said, you want beer bowl? You, oh, want, well. you want cabbage? You want brown bread? No, thank you, Milos. <laughs> and uh, I would, um, we would talk, and we, and I remember at one point he, 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 because he did not have much of a command of the language then, and he still doesn't to some degree. As I saw him recently, he's kind of reverting now. But he would say, "Read me the scene," and then he would re- repeat the scene. Okay, mm-hmm. this is how he did it. It's sort of like. It was almost like uh, the diving bell and the butterfly kind of thing. And, and so then he would disappear down this little corridor that went to the bathroom, and he'd come back, and he was McMurphy, and he would do the scenes just from memory from what I would just say to him. And um, uh, right then I knew it was going to be good. He was the best McMurphy. He was better than Nicholson. And <laughs> and then I would go back to my little room at the marina where my wife was, you know, she was – used to cooking out there, you know, across the country in Long Island, and I'd go back to my little room there, which I'd had to move to, and and uh, I would, I, I would, you know, based on our conversation this morning, I'd work everything through and clean it up, then I'd read it to him again the next morning, and that was the process, and then there was the script, and 
Yeah, yeah I knew that it was a very intensive no, very, uh, yeah. collaboration. But w- as you're as you're crafting it and as you're finding the soul of the piece, what what what, what became the predominant themes that you were trying to explore with it? Oh, well, I never th- you never think of theme. You know, I don't think you. I mean, you know, we were given these people by Ken Kesey. You know, mm-hmm. Nurse Ratched and um, and and McMurphy and 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 Bromden the Indian, and we were given these people, but they they stood for things. Of course, very much, they stand for different things for different people. I've got to say one thing, and, and uh, you know, stop me if I go on too long about anything. No, 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 please. Or if I sound like I'm blowing my own horn, I never want to do that. But I'm, I'm eating this up. This is okay. great. This is one right. of the best interviews we've had in a long time, so well, please keep at it. Well, here's the thing is, is I, I, I've i had, I'd say, in my life, five to ten people tell me, total strangers. I just got a letter here from the other day. Somebody wanted to pay me money to read her strip, that the movie had changed their life in some way. Yeah. It was somehow the collision of the times, which was the, you know, the mid seventies and things were changing, you know, very rapidly. And you know, Nixon had was just out, and uh, the, the the Ford, you know, we were in this kind of interregnum, and and, uh, uh, and everybody knew things were different. And somehow, Nurse Ratched stood for the past. She mm-hmm. stood for everything that every yearning person who's at high school or college who wants to do something with their life. That's what blocks them. You know, I grew up in a generation in which the the, the big bestseller was the man in the gray flannel suit, right. and I remember everybody dressed in gray flannels. Everybody went to. Ad- I mean, I tried to get a job at an advertising agency. They turned me down. I tried to work for Procter and Gamble, and I remember that the um, you know the employee interrogation sheet because we took Triangle on tours, and you know Cincinnati we played, and this guy was the head of Procter and Gamble. He said, "Oh boy, you want we want you to work for you." I said, "Oh good, I'll have a job when I get out of college." And one of the questions. I remember was if you see somebody uh, across the street approaching uh, whom you think might have used to, might be of use to you, would you uh, hurry across the street to speak to him? And I and, I, and they had multiple choices. One of them was, or would you avoid him? And of course, I wrote, I'd avoid him. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would put. Too. <laughs> and of course, they didn't get the job. And somehow, it was that huge monolithic structure, and that and it's back. It's back in America full blast. It's what we've been fighting, you know, through this administration for the last eight years. It's, I think, uh, and I think, I think youth are a bunch of wusses myself. I think, you know, I hope there'll be a change, you know. Um, I, 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 I'm right now in, in some crisis because my, uh, Todd's wife, my, my daughter Serena, who, has had three babies. She's now 43 years old. Um, has gotten pregnant, and they're having another baby at age 43. And and uh, and uh, she was having a tough time, but I think she's going to be okay. And I pray for him. I pray for him because he's my hope to change yeah. the country again. I mean, this country was very good to my father. He came from nothing. He came from the ghetto. You know, he came from dumbbell tenements and, and, and septicemia and rickets and all those things. And, you know, he built this grand and wonderful life, and it was all taken from him. Yeah. But I and, and I thought, oh, you know, what a lucky so-and-so I am. But now I, I feel like I don't. my wife doesn't really want to live in this country anymore. You know, she's kind of, uh, um, I'm Jewish, and she's kind of sort of old guard New York. We're a very, very strange pair. Right. <laughs> and maybe that's why, you know, uh, it works. But I, I really feel, you know, Nurse Ratched is the corporate America that we're living in now. Right. It's the brand. No, Ratchet is the brand, you know, and here we are, you know, pummeling our fists against this thing. Well, none of these things I would ever articulate. We never got into anything theoretical. You know, that was, I think, why I was hired, because they went through so many guys who were trying to get in, and everybody kept giving theories. I think the whole thing about movies is forget the theories. There are no theories about movies, you Absolutely. know, which is, it's what is. What is in what is in the story? You know what is you know well, who are these people? Because there's nothing more fascinating than if you make real people. You know, I mean, uh, if I have any gift, it's like I I remember um, 
I keep talking. I think I've lost you. I haven't lost no, you. No, you haven't lost you me have at all. Lost I was all. just going to say about it, in Shoot the Moon, I remember. So, okay, so this guy, this gas station attendant in Ogden, Utah, is supposedly one um, been left. Uh, he's one of the beneficiaries of Howard Hughes's will, okay? So that moment, my star was in the ascendancy and so on, and what was I going to do next? And, and, uh, and, uh, the guy who ran Universal said, "Listen, this we, they, we these two guys have just bought this thing. They got the rights to this guy's life. Will you go to Utah with one of these producers, <laughs> and 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 talk to this guy? You know." So I said, "Okay." I did it as a favor to him. Well, you know, so we fly to Salt Lake, and then the the uh, I remember there was this green limousine. You know, I thought it was strange. I've never seen a green limousine. You know, when you hit Utah, <laughs> you know, and this guy picks this up. And we were hungry, so we stopped, and and he was Mormon, the guy. I didn't know that till after we had lunch, and and the waitress, you know, in the, the, you know, I said, gee, what a you know what a lovely waitress, how polite she was, and he said, well, she's got that Mormon aura. <laughs> and suddenly I was interested, you know, because that's how he saw, <laughs> that's how he saw women, you know, like it was part of the the church, you know, like and the girl, she did have an aura about her. You know, there's something about it, something sacred about her, you know. Was she wearing the special underwear that Mitt Romney? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. No, and I don't. You know, I mean, I had enormous respect for Mormons after that because uh, I saw what an uphill thing. But when I got and I met, I met Melvin, I thought, he's me. He's yeah. me 20 years ago. I don't care if he's here pumping gas, you know. His marriage was in wreck. He had his little daughter, right, Darcy, right. and so on, and all that, you know. But I'll never forget the day. Uh, then uh, we went down. Uh, we did his trip. I spent, I lived with him for three weeks, you know. Really? Was, oh, yeah, I lived with Melvin for three weeks. Not, You know, not in the same place. We just retraced his whole trip, and we sort of retraced his life. He was... Uh, he came from a, this tiny town in Nevada called, uh, 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 originally called Gabs, Gabs, Nevada, where they make lithium, you know, for mm. my, for uh, depression, right. isn't it? For depression and, and migraines, I believe. And, and it's the most horrible thing. It's like coal mines, and they mine this stuff off these flats, you know, this, and, and, and it's disgusting work and horrible. And he mm-hmm. said, well, this is how I began. And, so we went through the various, and then he sold this, and he sold that, and he sold fish off the back of a truck and all that kind of thing. And then he showed me where he picked up um, he Howard. And uh, then he eventually delivered me to uh, Orange County, uh, where his his wife, uh, Linda, where she lived um, uh, with her second husband, who was worked on Caltrans, okay? And he was, uh, and his little girl was there, and uh, so I now dispatched Melvin, you know, because I, I didn't want him there while I was interviewing to hear her side of the story. Right. And I remember sitting outside the Disneyland Motel because he was going to, you know, uh, drive back to the um, airport in Orange County next morning, go home, go back to Ogden, and pump gas again. So he said, "So what do you think, Bo?" I said, well, what do I think about what? He said, what do you think about my getting the money? I said, I believe you, Melvin. I said, I believe you. And I, I said, that, you know, and if there's anything right, you'll get this money, which was, I think, you know, it's, I don't know, nine figures or something. You know? Yeah, yeah. And there were uh, other beneficiaries. It was, a, you know, what do you call it, a holographic will and so on. Hey, what an and, amazing story. I'm hearing you talking about, uh, I'm hearing you talk about Shoot the Moon and, and Melvin and Howard and, and, and Cuckoo's Nest, and, for, uh, and forgive me, I know you think you're, you're, you're giving a monologue here, but I, I'm just listening in awe. I, I, oh, yeah. well, thank you. I'm glad. You're not but anyway, as we sat outside this motel, I, he said, well, so what do you think? I said, I, and I told him that. He said, I'll never see a nickel. Well, he said, what, what, what chance do I have against Howard Hughes's family's lawyers? Yeah. And he was right. True. He was right, you know. And so, and with all these characters, you know, um, and even with Slade, you know, Slade was on my brother. You know, uh, they had shown me this film uh, originally. Uh, 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 pre- pre- it's perform- based on a foreign film. Um, yeah, an Italian film with Vittorio Gassman, uh, Profuma di Donna, and uh, and I saw it. It was it's quite it's sort of remote, you know, now to, to what we finally did, but. 
but it was kind of putting together. But I, and uh, they, I think Marty Brast, who I deeply adore, one of my closest friends, is who directed it, um, mm. and is now have been excommunicated by Hollywood because of Gili. Uh, what is, it's what not his fault, you know. And, no, it's uh, not his fault. No, and uh, and so uh, and uh, so I, I I saw ten minutes. And I remember. They, I think they were desperate for a screenwriter and. I had been putzing around, and I remember, so I went into the screen room at um, at Universal. I hadn't seen 10 minutes of this movie, and I realized it's my brother Chester who was uh, who who had mimicked my father's life, had made millions of dollars, lost it all to alcohol, oh. and uh, was living in diapers at the Ritz Carlton Hotel in New York, and was. Um, uh, five months behind on his rent, and I went to see him to try to rescue him, which was hopeless. And and I remember thinking, you know, so I would only say to anybody, you know, like it's out of nowhere that you decide, you, you know, something pulls you, and so yeah. nobody says to me, and nobody whispers, you've got to do this. So I thought I can do this because I know this person. Right. That he happens to be a guy who's an ex-army officer who I then melded with somebody else I knew, you know. And he's in pictures of everything you know in life, but something has to pull you, yeah. And the things that were lousy, you know, were things which I, you know, used to, yeah, because I had to build a road or fix a wall. Or <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't know. Well, let, let me talk to you a little bit. I know we're running short on time, but. Oh, I'm for, sorry, yeah. Forgive me, I have to ask you about these films. Uh, yeah. With Scent of a Woman and, and, and City Hall, which I consider an incredibly underrated film. Uh, d did you know Pacino was on board, and did you craft those those characters with him in mind? No, no, um, uh, not at all. You know, um, uh, the first choice, you know, I'm probably talking out of school here, was Nicholson for uh, Scent of a Woman. Right. And he was at that time shooting a movie, and and uh, he said, I can't read a script while I'm shooting. He, under, you know, I, he reached Marty and I at lunch, and uh, he asked to speak to me. And I remember, him, and I, you know, I felt I wasn't the director. And he said, I, you know, it just, that's, and he didn't say it's his policy. He was very nice and polite, you know. I knew his manager, Sandy Bressler, you know, and I said, well, I feel funny about approaching Jack about this thing like this. And he said, well, don't feel funny, Bo. You put three cars in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> and so I talk, and, and and I got off the phone. I said he won't read it until after he finished shooting. And I sort of looked at Marty. I knew the answer, what my answer would be. And Marty said, that's it. And Jack was, uh, and Pacino was in the number two position. Yeah. And as soon as that happened, he went right in and did the part. And I remember we came to New York in August, and and I remember it was oh, it was a terribly hot day. We met up at the Mark Hotel across the street from the Carlisle we were staying, and and I uh, uh, and he said, "How does this guy talk?" And I said, "And all I know is I because I was living now in Northern California, in New York, California. And they're obsessed with the they were in those days obsessed with the Oakland Raiders." You know, mm -hmm. and they had this owner uh, uh, once, Coach Al Davis, who's actually a guy from Brooklyn who speaks with a southern accent. Okay, and so it's sort of this totally ersatz southern accent. I said, "Have you ever heard Al Al Davis talk?" You know, and they sort of all imitate a famous Alabama coach, Bear Bryant. I don't know if you ever remember him. Right. The way right. these guys talk, they they sort of bark. And in fact, in the <laughs> army, they're taught people are taught to talk that way because the army was originally a profession for southerners and they bark and uh and uh, that's the way this guy talks and slurs everything and i tell you and that's when i knew we had the right guy i mean he just answered me and he and he was uh slayed you know just everything that i imagined about him you know it, then on, that... uh, we, we we just began to work together more and more you know in fact he uh, I, somehow that relationship with an actor was there well, Pacino is anyone that knows anything about me knows that Pacino is, in terms of acting, he is an absolute idol of mine, and I, oh, I, can't, I cannot imagine how rewarding it must be for for a writer when you when you have those long stretches of dialogue to hear the, those words spoken so beautifully beautifully by someone like Pacino. He gets it, you know, and he has yeah. no background for it at all. He gets it exactly. I mean, he grew up in the South Bronx, you know, and Fort Apache there, and. You know, and uh, I mean, uh, he his background is from off Broadway and so on, but he's I mean, 
you know, if Al is in the right zone, I, there's no one better. I mean, he's a, he's a genius because he somehow he works from the inside out of the character. He finds them. He knows who these people are because he somehow that's in him to identify with those feelings. He's able. He's able. He's able. To, to translate that to the audience, he's able to project that to the audience. You know, he's able to get it out there, and he's fearless. He's absolutely yes. fearless. And I think any artist that's worth anything—I don't care in any medium—you have to have something like that in you. You know. Well, there's there's something I find of his that he, he he's always very honest, and yet at the same time he su- he surprises you. Oh yeah, uh, I can see that last that last experience between. He and uh, John Cusack in City Hall. Oh yeah. There's so many little wonderful moments yeah. in the silence between that beautiful dialogue. Oh good. Behavior. Oh good. Oh, I, I, yeah, I thought that last scene was good. I thought Harold Becker did a wonderful job. I'm trying to do something together with him and Al now, but I don't know if it's going to come to any fruition. We talked, you know. It's um, it just you know, life in Maine is a big change, and uh, yeah, yeah. and. Uh, it's just I'm, I'm allowing myself to live for the first time in my life. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful, though. You deserve and, it. Yeah, uh, and so you know, it's you know, it's more of an adventure to live in Maine than this to sort of sit down at the typewriter in the morning and right, imagine. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just had before I let you go, I had one question about you just alluded to it, uh, an upcoming project, and, and another question about Sin of a Woman. Yeah. It, after watching this film for you know. 15 you know 15 years I, at the very end of it do you think that Frank Slade would have backed Charlie no matter what his decision would be at the end of the film no matter what is well you know it's he, hard for me to to he loves Charlie you know and whatever he, I don't know I don't I wouldn't want to go there but I could only tell you he loves Charlie whatever Charlie wants he would want for Charlie he doesn't it's sort of um I think Slade sees himself in Charlie, sees the best of himself in Charlie. He sees the kind of purity and and aspirations in Charlie that he's lost. Yeah. And yet there's something very, very pure about Slade. You know, you know I've had m- people say to me, you know, that it's misogynistic, the movie. And I've had people like Barbara Streisand, who I've worked with, say, but I love Bo is his attitude towards women. You know, when he comes down from seeing the high-priced prostitute, you know, in the Fifth Avenue building, I remember he comes out. Yes. And the only line he says, what a beautiful woman. What you a beautiful know. woman, yeah. Yeah, and so I just, uh, yeah, I don't know how to answer the question except that whatever would satisfy that feeling, that sense of paternal, that he feels, don't sell out, Charlie. You know, do but he keeps tempting him. He says, "Do the deal, go to Harvard." Right, you know? right. Mm-hmm. But but he doesn't mean it. Well, so so I think that the project that you've alluded to is is for Fifi, which is something that Harold Becker w- wants to mount for for Pacino. Yeah, well, we're having some bumps there with the producer, and I don't know what's going to happen, but I hope it'll come back to us. And I've done a draft for them, and I'm very excited about it, but. It's you know I, I, there's no more to say. It's one of those internist and squabbles that always right. happens in Hollywood. And I don't really know this producer very well. He's somebody who comes from has happened in so much from real estate now, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, or track houses or God knows what. Or it's Dorothy Parker might say the Utica Drop Tool and Forge Company, and they always think they know everything about movies. And right. I know I'm being mean right now, but I don't care. <laughs> No, I think I think you're right. You're, you're right. absolutely right. You know, Dead on. Yeah. yeah. So it's so nice of you to to have me on. I so appreciate it. Um, it's Chris and Jamie and uh, and, and Jerry and yes, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, thank I, you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and and um, and thank you for some you know such good questions. It was a good feeling. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. You're 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 a great uh, idol to all of us, and thank you for your work so yes, much. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye.